Hello, this is Valdemar Januszczak, art critic, documentary producer and presenter. And thanks for watching Perspective, YouTube's home for classical art. The slow passage of time on objects exposes these to all kinds of aggression. External agents and human activity act on them, damaging them, wearing them out, rusting them, rotting them. Water, fire, insects and microorganisms are together with man their fiercest enemies. What makes man different from the other forces is that they are the only ones who can stop or hold back the process which without their intervention would be irreversible. Scientific interest in art conservation has developed over the last century based on science and technology. The main criterion is that nothing that is external or foreign to the piece should be added. In those cases where it is essential to transgress this general principle, two requirements should be rigorously met. Whatever has been added should be clearly appreciated, and it should also be possible to remove it without this jeopardizing the integrity of the whole. Moreover, in many cases, it is necessary for the piece of work to recover its function and arrangement. These requirements are the result of the experience accumulated by curators who have learned that a piece of work is never definitively restored. Technical advances occur very quickly and respect for what could be done in the future makes restorers work cautiously so that their current intervention does not obstruct future restorations. The artworks and objects of cultural interest that fill the display cases of museums only represent a tiny fraction of human production over the years. They are not even representative of the total quantity of artworks that have been preserved up until our time. And that's because the majority of the world's artistic heritage is not on display. It is stored in security facilities, treasured for its commercial value, which does not always coincide with its value as an artwork. Safes, reinforced vaults and underground stores, protected against fire, flooding and earthquakes, hide thousands and thousands of pieces that were, at some moment, made for collective use and enjoyment. Thousands of treasures hidden from the light of day, which nonetheless need to be preserved. The scientific point of view has been so important in the development of criteria for artistic restoration that the need became clear to create specialized centers provided with the latest technologies to carry out this huge task. One of these centers is the Spanish Cultural Heritage Institute. Its radial architecture clearly expresses the convergence of the different branches of art and science that is its aim. The work carried out here is done based on the exchange of information among the different disciplines, a permanent dialogue between analysts and technicians by which, in the end, culture and art are strengthened. The teams of experts that work here are up to date with the most modern lines of research into techniques and science applied to the conservation of heritage. In 
the laboratories, analysis work is done that facilitates the work of curators and restorers at the center. Here, analysis is done on pigments, varnishes, glues, mortars, paper, wood, parchment, inks, metal, and other materials that man has learned to use to express his dreams. The electron microscope, dedicated exclusively to the field of art conservation, is essential for day-to-day -day work. Diving into the microscopic universe, the specialist curator can find out much of great interest when it comes to undertaking intervention. For example, it is possible to penetrate into the interior of the supports used by artists and to determine their nature with a high degree of accuracy. Using a tiny splinter extracted from the back of a painted board, it is possible to establish the kind of wood that the artist used as a support. The restoration process will proceed according to the outcome of this test. The center's documentation records are very important. A highly specialized library on artistic and technical matters allows information to be obtained beforehand for each project. A great many specialized books and journals are kept here. An extensive photographic library includes different archives, holding plates of great interest in terms of artistic heritage since photography began. Analyzing these plates, which are sometimes more than a century old, and comparing them with the work's current state, the curator can obtain crucial information when it comes to intervention. Faced with the challenge of deteriorating artworks, the curator can tackle conservation and restoration treatment in different ways. In some cases, and with some works like this Art Nouveau lamp from the beginning of the century, the aesthetic and decorative value is foremost, and so the piece must be treated, cleaned, and conserved to eliminate all the problems that might be present. In other cases, pieces may have a religious or cultural value, such as this terracotta, which comes from Ibiza, and which symbolizes a Punic tannier. This piece must be treated according to certain scientific and technical criteria, and the aim is to prepare it for exhibition and display. The analytical possibilities that the new exploration systems offer the curator provide him or her with a solid foundation on which to base his or her criteria for intervening in the work from the purely material point of view. Once the greatest possible amount of specific data about its material condition has been extracted from the piece, it is then analyzed as a human work. This means investigating the historical and personal circumstances of its creation with the aim of achieving an in-depth understanding of the object's essence. Then the conservator turns to technology for the intervention, paying attention to the general maxims of restoration, but never forgetting that each piece is different to others, and this requires individual treatment. X-rays show us what is hidden without damaging the surface, which makes them perfect for art restoration whose general criteria involve, above all, preserving the original. The Institute's radiology department contributes to the overall task with powerful equipment, able to work at a very high degree of penetration, which means that the room must be very well insulated. Here, work is done on pieces whose sizes and nature vary considerably, and the information that is extracted constitutes valuable material for those who will later undertake the intervention. 
The x-rays of large wooden sculptures, for example, reveal the presence in the interior of metallic elements, which may or may not be integral parts of the piece. On other occasions, what the x-rays show underneath the visible paint layer are not corrections or changes, but complete works which, due to the extreme poverty of the artists, were reused as supports for new paintings. One of the most curious cases to have happened in this radiology department was the discovery that this work by Rizzi, St. Ignatius of Antioch, was made up of two hidden works, which radiation revealed to have been sewn together and then used for the new work. Spectral images that overlap, art that exists and which, at the same time, does not. X-rays are also used with extraordinary results to examine the contents of very ancient documents written on metallic supports that have become very corroded. This is the case with this bronze plaque, the support for a document that could be essential for further knowledge of the ancient Iberian language. The responsibility of the restorer of this document, with its great informative value, is lessened once the x-ray of the piece has been carried out. Even if the later cleaning techniques create confusion or loss of signs in the text, this is nonetheless preserved by the x-ray. Its words will be preserved for history. There is an ever-growing desire to make heritage conservation an obligation to bequeath to posterity those items that history has left to us. That is why the restorer needs to access all kinds of procedures, whether they are mechanical, chemical, or in the case of this piece, steam brushing, or the preparation of poultices or gels able to penetrate the most inaccessible cracks. Aware of the appearance of new techniques that can be applied to their work, restorers carry out cleaning using everything from lasers, able to discriminate between colors, to ultrasonic devices adapted from those used by dentists for dental cleaning. The Institute's Documents and Book Service has developed its own system for the cleaning and recovery of very carbonated lead seals which consists of occasional electrolysis using platinum electrodes and acidulated water. And this is completed with subsequent washing and the application of a synthetic resin to protect the metal surface. So the seals remain linked to the documents forming a protected hole that allows them to be consulted by scholars. This document has been seriously damaged by the chemical substances that make up the inks, which can have very diverse natures. Sometimes their acidic nature can burn the paper, acting as a support. However, there are occasions on which the acidity contributes to preserving the original writing instead of destroying it. This is the case with information contained on the 17th century labels that appeared on the back of this set of panel paintings by Francisco Zubaran. Although a large part of the label has been lost, the ink burnt the paper and reached the surface of the wood, and the marks of the writing were imprinted on it. On the side entrance doors of the Sacrarium, he painted two angels in life-size, with censers in their hands, and in the corridor leading to the tidy part of the Sacrarium, paintings of some clerics of this order can be seen in life-size, which are admirably carried out and very natural-looking with realistic expressions and excellent chiaroscuro. This is how an 18th century traveler describes these paintings, which made out part of the ensemble in the Casusian monastery of Jerez de la Frontera, until they were taken from where they hung and transferred to the Cadiz Museum. There is a mystery behind these works. They were designed as an ordered set, 
and nobody took the trouble at the time to write down the arrangement. Now, thanks to the labels that have appeared on their backs, it has finally been possible to determine the arrangement and they can be correctly displayed. This fulfills another of the maxims of restoration. What has been conceived as a whole should be restored as such. The artistic importance of the Thurbaran ensemble has meant that restoration has been tackled in a particularly detailed and systematic manner. Contemporary critics wholeheartedly agree with the opinion of the traveler, and they consider these works to be highly representative of the artist's expressive mature period. Subaran was 40 when he completed them, and was at a crucial point in his career. Art restoration professionals are obliged to seek the support of whatever sciences may help to carry out their task in the best possible way. They must make decisions with full knowledge of what they are doing in order to avoid irreparable errors. This is why they draw up an overall analysis plan whose results will guide intervention. In this case, a paint sample was taken to establish the chemical nature of its components. This is a delicate operation that always damages the work. However, fortunately, the analytical capacity of a modern laboratory that specializes in artworks, like the Institute's chemistry department, does not require large samples. The operations that are carried out with the sample are no less delicate than its extraction. What is sought is to identify the nature of the different strata that make up the paint layer. And so it must be looked at side on. In order to make it possible to handle, the analyst puts it in a block of synthetic resin that will then be reduced to the point where the sample can be accessed. From this moment on, handling must be done extremely carefully, since the smallest error will mean an irreplaceable loss. For those who know how to look, the stratigraphic cutting of a layer of paint contains precious information about varnishes, pigments, primers and preparations. Magnified enough times, these samples reveal important data about the artist's way of working and preferences, and also about the successive versions that the work experienced over time. In this sample, the existence of a red repainted layer can be seen over the original strata. This is a valuable piece of information that, once known to the curator, helps to make decisions. Finally, a third sample shows evidence of the existence of a thick layer of oxidized varnish that distorts the original coloring of the work. However, what we see under the microscope is not enough when we want to know the chemical nature of the strata that make up the paint layer. This is crucially important information for those who are to intervene in the work, since incorrect treatment may cause interactions between the different chemical substances present and could badly damage the piece. A computerized analysis device is used for this, and its results establish the nature of these sample's components. And so the products and processes most appropriate for its treatment are defined in such a way that the restorers can carry out their work safely. They now know that the elimination of the layers of oxidized varnish is possible and desirable, and they act on this information.
The aid of x-rays is essential for an in-depth analysis of the works. With their help, the Institute's radiology service has fully studied the Subarans from the Jerez Monastery. By penetrating the successive layers of the paintings, a new universe of information about the creative process is revealed. The phases of this process are shown and parameters for comparison are set, covering what conclusions can be reached, both as regards the ensemble and each work in particular. It is too often forgotten that the paintings are not always works by a single artist. Many great master painters had workshops of helpers who took responsibility for the most routine and laborious tasks. Later on, the master intervened in order to complete or correct the work. Many of these interventions can be detected today with great accuracy thanks to radiology. The comparative analysis of these pieces allows the specialist to debate over the degree of intervention by the master Thubaran in each of these. Here, comparison is based on something as subtle as the type of brushstroke used by the artist, its uniformity, its vigor, its fluidity. It is also possible to ascertain the order followed when carrying out the painting. When we see the complete head of a bishop under a mitre, it is then possible to say that the head was painted whole to make the mitre fit more easily later on. In these details, a specialized analyst finds much informative material that sometimes completely refutes current theories. The artistic restorer also has available an exploration procedure that is similar to x-rays, although with the added advantage that safety measures are not needed to use it. Reflectography involves using infrared radiation to penetrate beyond the visible surface of the painting revealing the consecutive stages of creating the painting from the first sketch on the canvas. The information taken by curators with these explorations can be crucial for their work. Penetrating further and further into the work, it is possible to observe the preparatory drawings of the artist, often done with a charcoal. These lines show the initial idea, the one that the painter had about his work before starting it. These are embryonic marks which would later be followed to a greater or lesser extent by the artist in the creative process that followed. The treatments required by the conservation of contemporary artworks make up a separate chapter in the set of artistic conservation techniques. The institutions that specialize in this kind of works, like Madrid's Reina Sofia Museum, are obliged to respond dynamically to the demands that arise with the deterioration of very different materials that are all too often ephemeral. It is clear then that the details of art conservation cannot be built up into a system. This is an occasional task which only makes sense with respect to the specific work it is applied to.
It is neither a science nor a craft, but the result of a chain of considerations, the first of which is to respect the artistic object as the result of the artist's intention. The absolute liberalization of aesthetic criteria that occurred throughout the last century means that artists use all kinds of materials that were never before thought of as artistic supports. There is no limit that has not been transgressed. Back then, nobody thought that time would also act on those inflammatory and daring works, but time has passed. In this painting, the painter Benjamin Palencia introduced a number of elements into the traditional oil, like oak leaves and feathers, that had been lost from a number of areas. Before treatment, the aim was to reproduce the same materials that the artist had used. This was done with a series of samples that were aged in a laboratory chamber, and then a number of adhesives were tested out to see which was best before being applied. The conservation workshops of the Reina Sofia Museum have the necessary resources to meet different challenges. The works restored here are some of the most important in contemporary art. Consequently, its work methods integrate very advanced analytical systems and any technique that may be adapted to its restoration work, such as the settlement of the paint layer by applying heat using infrared rays. As for the workshop, the most modern techniques rub shoulders with other more traditional ones in accordance with the needs of each piece, since, once again, general rules must submit to the peculiarities of each piece of work. What is common to all cases is the need for information about their condition, and infrared reflectography decisively contributes to this. The working methods followed in the study of contemporary art are basically similar to those followed in the study of works from previous periods. However, it is necessary to bear in mind the unique nature of the work that is to be analyzed, and specifically the different materials used. It is surprising that artistic supports have varied so little over time. Although they used very different chemical substances, both Picasso and Dürer used canvas backings and oil paint to create their works. Likewise, both Dürer's and Picasso's works can be analyzed using the stratigraphic technique. Unlike other centers with more of a hierarchy, the decisions in this department are taken after each of the curators expresses and defends his or her opinion on the matter. These are often decisions on very specific matters. For example, this is the case with this mobile by Ángel Ferran called Mujer Hacendosa, with the members of the team debating over the suitability of replacing the hemp cord that joins the pieces with another one of similar characteristics or the alternative of strengthening and consolidating the original cord. The crux of the matter lies in establishing whether the cord as an object forms an essential part of the piece, or whether, on the other hand, it is only a necessary element because of its function, but its nature is irrelevant for the whole work. This Miro sculpture of cast bronze with welded iron bars was subjected to study for packaging since it was requested for an exhibition to stop it suffering damage, as has happened here with this small deformation. Other times the problems are very similar to those that occur with older works. For example, this polished sculpture by the magnificent sculptor Alberto, we encounter the problem of recovering the original patina, 
which must have been very similar to the one shown on this other similar sculpture. Curators of contemporary art often have the privilege to receive the best possible advice for the restoration of works, that given by the artists themselves, who in many cases are still alive and working. In cases where the painters are no longer alive, the family is requested to provide all the documentation possible, including notes, videos and photographs about the artist's way of working or the brands of paint used. Information that can be very valuable when it comes to restoration. The artists' responses to the restoration of their works is very different in each case. There are those who resist the idea of restoration and those who work closely with the curator, providing information about the materials used and the work system. This information is filed and it will be very useful for future interventions in that artist's works. Many of the works in the Reina Sofia Museum's collection are drawings and paintings on paper. The process of restoring this graphite and India ink drawing, a work by the painter Benjamin Palencia, has a number of stages. First, mechanical cleaning is done to remove surface dirt that has become stuck, and then tests are done with solvents of various kinds to eliminate the yellowish stains of some substance until one that works is found. After studying the specific conditions of the work, cleaning is carried out if necessary, following a laborious method that consists of the occasional application of minimal quantities of solvent using glass capillary tubes, or if not, the art object is worked on under a special hood that lasts until cleaning is complete. Anthropology is a science whose limits are as vague as people's lives. And anthropological museums are the results of the human urge to collect and analyze the information that humans ourselves produce. Here there are objects that were familiar to our parents, to our grandparents, worn utensils polished by contact with human skin, instruments that let us escape from cold, hunger, loneliness, tools that helped us make life more comfortable, companions on our species' long voyage through time, survivals. Without a rigorous order, an anthropology museum's stores would come to look like a giant auction house because of the great variety of its collections. These museums house objects from material life, together with another series of things that were collected, sound recordings, ethnographic documentation that shows us forms of everyday life and their development since the arrival of photography. This building was designed in the 60s as a museum of contemporary art. Those were economic boom times for Spain, and the building which was planned and constructed in those years was given the best of everything, as the magnitude and the complexity of these technical facilities show. Like the system to keep the building at specific levels of humidity and temperature. A system that was impressive for the period. Later, the Anthropology Museum, its basements and stores, filled up with a strange universe, an unusual collection of objects. A kind of huge antique shop with wares chosen at the time by expert eyes and scrupulously conserved since then. 
These pieces are completely different, able to teach us lessons about the richness of diversity. For a long time, the museums, cupboards, stored collections of clothing and garments from very different social levels, places and periods. Regional costume, characteristic fabrics, crochet work, lace, silk, linen, whose restoration and conservation had to be attended to by the curator. Work with fabrics is always labor-intensive and requires great attention. In the fabric workshops, the curator had to find an answer to all the problems and needs, such as finding the inks that are closest to the color of the works on which intervention is being carried out. Washing, which requires particular attention to the fabric or the poor stability of the fabric sinks. or to the examination and correction of the damage that affects large fabrics. For this last issue, the curator has a large light table with a grid structure which helps to line up the warp and weft of the material correctly, regardless of what fibers that fabric is made of. Fashions change, and this fact concerns not only clothing, but bodies too. Old clothing does not fit on modern mannequins, and so these must be rounded out a little before being used in the workshop. There is also much anthropological heritage made of leather, and this has a very important role in the workshops. Harnesses of different kinds for different purposes, whose careful examination and analysis provides new data about their history. Sometimes this information complements important aspects for anthropological work. The museum has another kind of piece that is not normally found displayed in a museum. Objects that are much closer to us and, like farm harnesses, knives or wooden spoons, show the complexity and diversity of human objects. It seems as if time has acted on these objects faster than it should have, or as if it had done so on us. In any case, the conservation of these familiar utensils is no small problem. Anthropology museums are good places to remember our childhood, or even better, the childhoods of different generations. A collection of toys able to delight young and old. Toys as innocent as the children who use them toys from other times when everything was different, but those in which a new form of entertainment was beginning to be seen. One that was going to change the way of seeing the world. When cinematography appeared, it was hardly anything other than a toy. 
a fairground curiosity. But the expressive imagination and ambition of its pioneers soon set it on the road to being a new art form based on light and movement. When sound was added to those first trembling images, the new form of expression became the most complete one of all. More than a century has passed since then, and cinema has produced hundreds of thousands of works. The passage of time on many of these has been merciless, and the world's film institutes like the Spanish National Film Institute have an ocean of celluloid on their hands, whose urgent conservation must be attended to. This is no easy task, because in cinema, work is not done on originals, but on copies. This is an art based on reproduction, and the material formerly used for the copies, nitrates, has a dangerous tendency to combust. In fact, they are true chemical bombs. The criteria of cinematographic restoration are permanently under debate. Against the general tendency of modern restoration which rejects anything added, some cinematographic curators maintain that cinema is a show, and that interventions should be imitative in order not to distract from the film. It is important to know as much as possible about the work so as to know how to undertake the task, and this requires thorough systematic and patient study beforehand, like the work of an alchemist. Sometimes an old film can be subject to study for more than three years before a single still is taken. It can be the case that there are various versions, which are quite unalike, for showing in different countries. It is common for years to pass before all the materials can be brought together, and finally the work of reconstruction from the original negative can get underway. In the sphere of cinematographic restoration, there are few who have contributed as much as Spanish director Juan Mariné. With hundreds of kilometers of recorded film to his name, he has spent many years attempting to perfect and conserve the art of celluloid at the Spanish National Film Institute. More than a restorer, Mariné has always been a keen researcher into new mechanisms and processes for the treatment of photographic material, an innovative imagination able to insist again and again on his ideas until they are carried out. Because when a reproduction of a film is made, it should not be similar to the original, but the same, identical, with no generation loss. As well as its work restoring film, the Spanish Film Institute has the responsibility of conserving cinematographic collections that hold more than 20,000 titles. This requires an enormous effort from the point of view of storage and of cataloguing all the roles of film. In principle, the film's materials have meant the division of the entire collection into two main groups. While the modern material acetate does not present any hazards, although it requires specific conditions of environmental stability and chemically neutral packaging, for the old nitrate materials, it has been necessary to create a specially designed stack following strict safety parameters. The special stack has a number of isolated cells, each one with its own automatic alarm systems and shaft for the removal of gases. The cells are kept at a constant temperature of 6 degrees centigrade and a relative humidity of 50%. Furthermore, the Film Institute is in charge of making copies on acetate of the vast majority of these explosive nitrate materials. Hora. 
In this way, it is possible to preserve the great and not so important works of art of our time for the knowledge and enjoyment of future generations. The creation and organization of an important new museum is a unique occasion for a global view of the many things that the art curator must consider. The thyssen bornemisza Museum is one of the great institutions of this kind, a pioneer in its day. Its extraordinary collection includes works from all periods and places, of all styles and all genre. It is a result of many years of selected acquisition in the international art market. Located on the Paseo del Prado in Madrid, opposite the legendary museum of the same name, it occupies the former Villahermosa Palace, built in the 18th century and modified many times since then. The thyssen bornemisza Museum's air conditioning is designed to hold the temperature at between 20 and 23 degrees centigrade, with a tolerance of more or less a degree and a relative humidity of around 55%, with a tolerance of around 5%. To install the thyssen bornemisza collection in the palace, it was necessary to carry out detailed engineering and architectural studies with the aim of providing the old palace with the infrastructure it would need to display and conserve the works with the maximum guarantees of stability. The difference between the concepts of restoration and conservation is made clear here. Restoration is necessary for objects whose material existence is endangered due to the action of external agents over time. Conservation, on the other hand, focuses on achieving the best conditions possible for the artwork in such a way as the passage of time will never endanger the piece's integrity. Restoration means intervention, while conservation can be understood as constant vigilance. The Thyssen Museum's collections, which come from a modern private collection created using strict criteria regarding the quality and material state of the pieces, were already in good condition before the museum was founded. Therefore, the starting point was ideal for attending to the conservation of the collection in a uniform way. The restoration department focuses on the monitoring of the pieces and preventative conservation. Bearing in mind the factors that surround the work, this involves detecting which of them might cause damage in order to create barriers and solve anomalies. Due to the quality and variety of its collection, the museum receives many requests for displaying some of its pieces at large international exhibitions of the most varied kinds. In these cases, the conditions demanded by the center in terms of the transport and security of its pieces are necessarily very strict. A special reinforced watertight and fireproof packaging is made for each object, and the atmosphere within it is the same as the one in which the work is normally displayed. This packaging includes a number of sensors that allow the conditions inside to be known at all times, so that a situation endangering the work will be detected as soon as it arises. The same precautions are also extended to certain pieces displayed in the museum itself. In this way, all these marvels of world art seem to have a safe future for many, many years. Each piece is a word in the never-ending dictionary of history. And our commitment to these words is found rooted within the human condition. It is not a minor activity. 
It is the only path that we as a species have been given to fight against the untiring passage of time towards death and forgetfulness.